Hello, everyone. Welcome to this health and internal displacement network webinar session on mental health in internally displaced populations. My name is John Bosco Chika Chukwaji. I'm a lecturer in psychology at the University of Nigeria in Osaka. The webinar is designed to probe issues of uh, mental health as it affects internally displaced populations. And nowhere is the negative impact of uh, internal displacement more evident than in the prevalence of uh, mental health conditions such as depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, and other mental health problems that appear in male and female IDPs in different ways. The central question of this webinar is to probe how health policy and interventions can respond to the crisis of mental health in these underserved populations. The Health and Internal Displacement Network, HIDN, was launched in April 2021 to promote research, engagement, and evidence driven policy on IDP health. The event of today is the third in our new 2021 HIDN webinar series, and it builds on the earlier ones that we have held in the month of May and uh, June. The uh, webinar of uh, today is going to, we are going to be listening to presentations by eminent researchers and experts in the field of internal displacement. Uh, the first speaker is Professor Nino Mahajville of uh, the Ilya State University in Georgia. And then we also have our second speaker as Professor Maria Helena Restrepo Espinosa of uh, Universidad del Rosario in Colombia. Uh, we are expecting a third speaker who currently uh, is not with us due to power failure in the country of uh, Ethiopia. But we are expecting that before we conclude, the speaker will also join us. Our speakers today will start off by presenting their key research on three quite different components of the issue of interest to us today. After which we will open up for broader discussion, questions and comments of uh, the other from the other participants. Each of the three speakers on this panel will have 10 to 12 minutes for their presentation. And uh, during, the quest, during the session, Please pose your questions and comments to the speakers by typing them into the chat box on Zoom. After the speakers have made their presentations, there will be time for them to discuss and reflect on your questions and comments. Please remember to keep your microphones on mute and videos off unless you are a, presentation, uh, unless you are a presenter or speaker. The session is being recorded and will be posted online as a podcast. If you do not wish to appear in the podcast, then please leave the session now. We will name, we are, we are now going to turn to our first speaker, Professor Nino, and she will be speaking to us on Georgian and Ukrainian IDPs and their mental health problems. Professor Nino, may I invite you to uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you, John Bosco, um, for uh, this kind uh, introduction. Um, uh, this is late afternoon in Georgia, Tbilisi. So afternoon, dear colleagues, dear um, friends, I'd like to uh, um, share my screen and um, present some data that um, my team uh, um, and some colleagues are here um, uh, with us now, that um, our team uh, collected, analyzed, uh, published, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I, I think that uh, some of you attended our network's previous seminar. So 
these figures are not uh, unusual or new for most of you, but still I would like to remind us, everybody, myself included, that in the landscape of global displacement, internally displaced populations are really majority, is really majority. So they, uh, they are, uh, the numbers are huge, 41.3 million. And, uh, and um, unfortunately, uh, they are, the most of them are located in the countries often war-torn countries of low and uh, middle resources. So uh, everybody um, knows that this complicates things and this complicates also mental health of uh, such populations. Um, and we already know for, for um, uh, solid uh, uh, studies that mental ill health and displacement unfortunately are strongly correlated and who uh, estimates that one person in five is living with uh, some form of mental disorder uh, it could be depression anxiety post-traumatic stress disorder as uh, john bosco mentioned or even psychotic uh, disorders um, so uh, we also know that uh, mostly, most prevalent is um, so-called um, cluster uh, that is called common mental disorders. So common, so widespread, um, very often met. So uh, this, these are again depression, anxiety, PTSD, and these ones are not only the comorbid uh, um, uh, disorders, but also pretty well researched as well. And our studies also included those disorders though. Um, in Georgia, we also explored psychosomatic um, distress. The aim of these two studies done in Georgia and in Ukraine uh, was to examine the prevalence of mental health, uh, mental, uh, common mental disorders but also study patterns of help-seeking behavior. Uh, um, many of you might uh, know that help-seeking is very strongly associated with, with the recovery. So if the person acknowledges the problem and actively uh, utilize the services around him or her, then uh, it uh, has higher uh, um, possibility or probability to lead uh, uh, to the well-being. So we wanted to see what, what are the patterns of uh, uh, help seeking. And also we wanted to come up with some uh, policy recommendations for, for, for countries of Georgia and Ukraine. Um, um, the method um, was actually the... Um, uh, a cross-sectional um, uh, study, but we used multi-stage random sampling in Georgia, stratified by region and displacement status. Um, and in Ukraine, um, our study uh, again was cross-sectional, uh, uh, nationally representative, but we used very unusual sampling methodology called time loc location sampling, because in uh, Ukraine, uh, internally displaced populations usually um, do not live um, in um, hotels or sanatoriums or, or uh, in uh, densely populated areas. They are um, diffused with the local, local uh, with the locals, so it was uh, um, pretty hard to reach um, uh, them. Um, in Georgia, the final sample was more than 3,000 persons, and in uh, Ukraine, you see that it was more than 2,000 persons. Uh, I, I would like to remind you about the Georgian context. We are located, uh, well, um, <laughs> next to Russia, uh, alas, so uh, after independence, um, uh, the, 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 there was this uh, pretty harsh prolonged uh, war with, with Russia, and we lost, in, it was 1990s, and we lost Abkhazia and so-called 
so to set here that, that we call Shida Kartli uh, to Russia. Then in 2008, there was very brief five days war, but pretty intense war resulting in, in displacement of 300,000 persons. And we uh, lost even more territory. So 20% of our territory is occupied um, by Russia nowadays. And the number of uh, IDPs reach 6% of the whole Georgian population. As for Ukraine, uh, my colleagues, Unfortunately, actually, uh, seven years ago, uh, Russia uh, annexed Crimea, Irimi, we call it. Uh, and then uh, in April, May, also the war conflict uh, started in the regions of Donetsk and Lugansk, resulting, resulting in a huge number of IDPs. Um, uh, million point five IDPs um, are uh, residing now um, across uh, Ukraine. So uh, are typical buildings. Uh, uh, we are um, older IDPs. Uh, uh, we are living some places they are still living in such uh, hotels and sanatoriums so that we have built uh, for IDPs um, from 2008. Um, um, we uh, assess their um, uh, mental health needs actually 20 years after the displacement for the older IDPs and actually um, four, five, uh, three, four years after displacement from the uh, recent war. And we saw that um, actually 30% we are meeting at least uh, criteria of the at, at least one mental disorder. Uh, uh, um, 23 we are meeting uh, criteria of post-traumatic stress disorder, 14 for depression, 10.5 for anxiety and comorbidity of all these three um, disorders was 5.4. We also looked whether there was difference in mental health burden of IDPs versus returnees. Returnees are those who after several months, actually seven, nine months uh, after the uh, 2008, uh, were returned to the buffer zone, borderline uh, uh, zone villages. And our hypothesis was, uh, was that they were suffering uh, more than, uh, than IDPs who were relocated in the peaceful areas because um, uh, returnees uh, are even now very often victim, victims of trafficking. A lot of uh, other uh, um, awful things are happening, like you know, stealing of uh, their livelihood and, uh, and also border craw crawling. Um, occupation is uh, uh, continuing in Georgia, so border is uh, um, unfortunately not respected. But what we saw was that returnees mental health and you see was much uh, um, uh, uh, so much better than 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 idp so returning to their roots to their um, uh, homes to their villages to their social supportive i don't know communities it seems that it was um, um, protective factor for the for, for them after a while we returned to the to the database and uh, uh, looked for the subclinical manifestations uh, subclinical manifestations or sub syndromal manifestation or a sub uh, sub threshold conditions are those who do not meet the criteria of clinical cutoffs and uh, but still people are suffering um, and if we want to early identify and or prevent uh, mental health uh, disorders, then uh, we should pay attention to subclinical conditions. And unfortunately, research on those uh, um, uh, manifestations is not uh, um, widespread. 
what we saw, um, uh, it was um, um, unfortunately heavy, heavy, heavy um, uh, picture. We saw that subclinical depression criteria was met by 27% as well as for anxiety. For PTSD, the, the numbers were low, but when we saw, for instance, um, deeper into the, into the depression, we saw that if the clinical manifestations of the depression was much more prevalent in, in women, in IDP women, subclinical depression, you see that men were suffering more than, than women. Um, as for the factors that we are associated with the um, uh, worse uh, mental health, uh, we are listing here four of them. So greater frequency of traumatic exposure, female gender, older age, displacement status. So older IDPs, we are uh, much more affected, even after 20 years. Uh, low levels of neighborhood support and poor community and bad economic situation. Uh, this uh, pie diagram shows those people who we are acknowledging that they, ha they had mental health problems and they sought help. This is one, one, uh, one fourth of the population, uh, affected population. So they, one fourth, 25% uh, we asking for help. I'm not talking about the quality of help because a lot of them, we are just going to the pharmacies, but anyway, around 20% acknowledged that they had mental health problems, but they did not seek care due to financial problems or uh, on stigma and so on and so forth. But more than half, around 55%, just reported that they do not feel any problems. And because of that, they do not seek care. But clinically, these people were meeting um, um, criteria of mental disorder. So these people uh, kind of normalized their, their condition. So their suffering was a norm. Uh, their um, insomnia, depressive mood, hopelessness uh, was accepted as, as, as a, a kind of usual lifestyle. So you see that around 75% actually did not seek help despite having uh, clinically um, important, magnificent, prominent uh, symptoms. Let's talk about Ukraine. In Ukraine, we also saw um, a pretty high, high uh, percentage of PTSD, 32, uh, depression and anxiety. And we saw um, comorbidity between these three um, uh, conditions. We saw even more uh, three morbidity than in Georgia, 9% had all three, then in Georgia, 5.5% uh, uh, suffered from, um, uh, from these three conditions simultaneously. As for the, uh, for the factors, uh, again, women were um, uh, much more uh, vulnerable. So gender uh, played role, older age, uh, bad and very bad household economic situation. Of course, uh, cumulative experiences of trauma exposure, more than four uh, traumatic events were um, associated with the worst uh, uh, outcomes and displacement status. We see that if they were displaced recently during the last year, they were suffering more. As for the um, treatment gap. So again, around 75% of those who we are meeting clinical criteria of common elder disorders, 75% um, of them did not uh, seek help. So you see that huge number of uh, adult IDPs 
are left without proper care. Uh, of course, there are a lot of reasons, but I'd love to highlight the mental health care systems in Georgia and Ukraine that are pretty old fashioned, um, uh, institutional based, of course, there are reforms that, that try to, um, to promote contemporary mental health services, but IDP's mental health is not uh, considered as a priority. Uh, there is a lack of biopsychosocial approach. Still, we are biomedically kind of oriented um, uh, mental health, um, uh, I don't know, specialists. Um, and, uh, there are fragmented services, but temporary services that are uh, uh, trying to, to address some needs of IDP populations, but they are not institutionalized. They, they, there is no systematic um, planning of the, of the IDP uh, mental health care. Also, I am reminding myself and also others that while IDPs, mental health uh, needs, uh, um, when we are addressing the needs, we should remember that war and traumatic exposures are not the only only um, experiences in the lives of these populations. These populations uh, uh, face marginalization, discrimination, social isolation, poverty, unemployment, a lot of ongoing threats that impact their mental well-being. So when we are designing some uh, uh, support services, we should really um, design them uh, acknowledging ongoing social determinants and not only young. And talking about the ongoing threats, I, I would like to, to present a, a brief uh, kind of uh, picture about the COVID-19 studies. Uh, this slide shows uh, two comparison of the two, um, uh, two studies, two cohorts. So we did it uh, in um, May, June uh, last year and this year. And you see that uh, uh, last year we had pretty high level of uh, adjustment disorder symptoms, depression symptoms, anxiety symptoms, and PTSD. And unfortunately, after six months, uh, this picture deteriorated even more. 52% uh, of, uh, um, uh, of the population meets adjustment disorder criteria. Unfortunately, depression um, rates increased. Uh, we have twice, uh, um, so, the, um, oh, sorry, we have twice uh, more than we had uh, um, uh, last spring uh, PTSD symptoms. And okay, uh, anxiety uh, stays stable, but uh, we see that population mental health is deteriorated. So we thought what, uh, what, uh, what, are uh, IDPs doing uh, and how are they doing? And we know that COVID-19 and the youth mental health, unfortunately, uh, the studies uh, in this field show that youth are pretty vulnerable uh, group and uh, they uh, bear uh, um, uh, <laughs> kind of pretty high um, impact of, of uh, COVID stressors. So um, we looked into the young IDP's uh, mental health um, uh, last year. Uh, we included uh, older IDPs and newer IDPs with age uh, range of 18-24 and 25-29. And we saw that their mental health problems were much more higher than, uh, than in general population. Anxiety level reached um, 50, post-traumatic stress uh, disorder uh, level 39, depression, Depression more or less corresponds to, to this year's uh, uh, depression rates in the general population. Unfortunately, um, uh, I think I, I mentioned that 
in um, in our big study of IDPs, we saw that even after 20 years of displacement, older IDPs who went into the prolonged war and and longer uh, displacement and and um, uh, some other uh, pretty harsh conditions. Older IDPs were experiencing much higher mental health burden than newer IDPs. So we thought that uh, perhaps this was the same here, but unfortunately, newer IDPs from 2008 war were uh, more vulnerable. And you see uh, this uh, red uh, uh, part of the, of the pie uh, represents uh, newer IDPs. And we see that in anxiety and PTSD and depression, they, uh, they are suffering more. Um, so these young people have uh, higher levels of mental health problems than older IDPs and then general population in Georgia. We might uh, conceptualize this as, as, as uh, uh, they were exposed to the war experiences in their childhood when uh, older IDPs uh, were actually born in, in the displacement. Uh, also, uh, IDPs from 2008 uh, mentioned some similarities between stressful experiences caused by the war and current pandemic. And these experiences are confusion, disbelief, fear, sense of danger to oneself or um, others' lives, uncertainty regarding future, etc. And we think that these connections might re-traumatize them and worsen their mental well-being if some steps are not taken. Uh, well, what should be done? <laughs> One could talk a lot uh, here, but uh, due to limited time frame, uh, I think that we should promote mental health literacy. We should promote awareness. We should promote. Uh, uh, we should address the stigma issues, and just include those who never address uh, uh, services. Either seek self care, self care, or seek uh, support. We should close uh, the treatment gap by prioritizing IDPs mental health as a huge public health issue, and uh, and design and implement cost effective interventions. And those interventions should be trauma informed. And uh, some of them should be trauma specific, I think. And I think that all the uh, spectrum of support should be utilized, starting from promotion, involving all levels of prevention, of course, management and recovery. I think uh, uh, this is all. And I'd love to, to uh, finish the presentation with the uh, uh, words, uh, wise words of um, our colleagues, and they they uh, they they write that internally displaced persons and families have yet to be given proper attention and sufficient care. The more we fail to provide for the needs of these vulnerable groups, the more we erode their resilience, which undermines the sustainability and inclusivity of our cities and communities. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for your attention. And uh, of course, uh, the questions, comments uh, um, are welcome. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Professor Nino Mahajvil, for the great presentation on um, Georgian and Ukrainian IDPs and their mental health. I am going to still encourage our listeners to drop your questions in the chat box. Professor Nino is going to respond to those questions in due course. We are now going to turn to the second speaker and uh, she will be talking to us on mental health among displaced children in Colombia. Professor Maria Helena, Restrepo Espinosa, it's your turn to speak. Hello, uh, thank you, uh, John. 
Uh, I'm going to share my presentation. Um, okay. I guess. Uh, uh, I think I'm not uh, uh, allowed to um, share my uh, presentation. Can you help me with that? Uh, yep, you should be able to now. Okay. Are you seeing the presentation at this moment? No, no, no. Maria Ellen, we don't see. No, I don't think it's. Oh, Maria Elena, no vemos todavía. Ah, qué bien. <laughs> yeah. A ver si la logran ver. Uh, wait a minute. Um, hold on. Just. Ahí la ven? Is, are you seeing it right now? No, no it's not common. No, uh, yeah. no, no. Hold on just a minute. I, I cannot see it. Wait. Ahora sí. Oh, okay. yeah, it's happened. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to share a research we did, uh, even though uh, we did it in the year of 2011 with Ilse Flink. Ilse was doing her um, doctoral uh, research in with the University of Rotterdam at um, uh, Holland with an Erasmus uh, scholarship. And with we did it also with a, a group of professors from the School of Medicine and Health Sciences of the Universidad del Rosario at Bogota, Colombia. Um, my uh, presentation's title is Mental Health in Early Childhood in for Enforced Internal Displacement. This paper, uh, which I'm going to share today, was published in the Social Psychiatry and Psychiatric Epidemiolo Epidemiology Journal, which you can maybe uh, kind of take a look if you want to deepen some of the things I, I cannot share today because of the time limit. But I'm going to uh, go through a, a context of the IDP and the uh, armed conflict in Colombia. The study design that we uh, uh, planned for the research, the main findings, conclusion, conclusions, and some recommendations uh, for future uh, research on IDP mental health, the, on the themes of IDP and mental health. Um, in Colombia, by this, by the time we made the research, we were the first country with IDPs in the world. Usually, we have at that time we had four, more or less the same, 4.9 million of uh, persons in the condition of uh, internally displaced persons, and uh, up to now, which uh, at that time were uh, more or less from 10 to 11.9 percent of the population, general population of Colombia. And now we have more or less the same percentage. I'm not sure, I couldn't find if we were still the first, but we usually change between the first, second, and third place in the world with IDPs, depending on other armed conflicts. Um, so we do have a, 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 a very important problem. We, as Dr. Rodriguez in the past webinar shared, we have had a history of violence uh, that has mainly uh, had a, a, a land tenure reason uh, because of different uh, conditions, uh, because of uh, uh, natural resources, mining, uh, narco traffic. Um, at, at, at when we call, when we spoke about violence, we were talking about the differences between liberal and conservative parties. That was mainly up to uh, middle of uh, uh, 19 kind of 1948 up to um, end of the 20th century. And latest, we have had a lot of uh, presence of armed actors and uh, a lot of threats and uh, intimidations, confrontations, homicides, massacres uh, that are, are generally uh, uh, occurring in very, um, um, in some regions that are fairly abandoned by the state and are very marginal and very uh, poor and with uh, a lot of uh, lack of commodities and basic needs. And we have different armed groups. We have military, paramilitary, 
uh, guerrilla actors and other uh, narco traffic and, and common delinquency groups. So we have a different uh, differences in the causes and, and the different armed conflicts and the type of conflicts. Um, this is CODES. Uh, we have a, a, an interesting situation with the law initiative that was um, uh, for f first recognized, even though the phenomena uh, goes back to the uh, beginning of the 20th century. Uh, it was recognized by the uh, uh, intervention of the United Nations Committee for Refugees, in Spanish, the ACNUR, UN, UNCR, uh, in the year of 1995. It was the first time it came to Colombia. And Francis Deng, a Sudanese uh, scholar from the Brookings Institution, um, made the uh, the idea uh, the, of the IDPs and the rights in uh, that were uh, assumed and accomplished by Colombia in the law of 387 of 1997. We were one of the first countries to have a law that recognized the condition of the IDPs, the rights, and the, um, the obliged the government and the state to provide attention in housing, education, and health care, which up to now we have not yet uh, satisfied. Um, this is uh, an image I would like to share because it's a common situation that most of the uh, IDPs are civilians uh, 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 affected by the armed actors, different armed actors, not only army, but the ones I mentioned, paramilitary guerrillas, but they're mostly in ethnic, indigenous, Afro-Colombians, and uh, other uh, uh, marginal groups. Marginal because they have not been recognized as part of the uh, country as only up to 1991 uh, when we had a new constitution. So that's very interesting because they were only uh, having rights and and uh, and recognition only after 1997, but uh, the indigenous and these marginal populations were uh, part of the country uh, with the constitution of 1991 that we're up to now ha uh, 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 having uh, the anniversary of the 30th year. Um, we had uh, different. We have we had differences, and, and there was an interesting influence with the peace process uh, in during the government of Juan Manuel Santos. From that uh, was really accomplished during the year of 2016, and afterwards it started to rise up. And before in the government, the the uh, previous government of Juan Manuel Santos, we also had a lot of. Uh, uh, displacement. So it has been kindly uh, very variable, but uh, it, it's, it remains constant, const constant as a problem uh, of the country. This, uh, uh, we were concerned, we were very uh, worried about the conditions of uh, very small children. We used to attend a very uh, deprived neighborhood at Bogota with the last year medical students in their uh, public health internship. And um, we kind of tried to look what the interventions, uh, what type of interventions we could consider for these children who were um, children of, uh, par with whose parents were um, forced, inter uh, forced displaced persons or they have been born after the, their families or parents have been displaced. Uh, we did a cross-sectional study in this neighborhood called Kennedy because it was it has been the neighborhood where, where uh, most of the displaced persons arrive at Bogota. Bogota is one of the main cities, if not the main, that receives uh, forced displaced persons from uh, the countryside. And uh, we uh, used uh, um, an instrument which was very interesting, the child behavior checklist for ages 1.5 to 6, I'm sorry, to 5, 6 years. And uh, it's uh, an instrument that has 99 items and it's uh, applied to the caretaker, the primary caretaker of the children. Um, 
We applied this in, in four kindergartens of the neighborhood, which you're going to see later in some images. And we had uh, 90 from the 279 sample, for it was a convenient sample, 90 were IDPs. They had a special uh, kindergarten for IDPs. Um, and there, we have, since, since we have the law, people are recognized and receive like an identity as displaced in order to be able to access to the attention that we, I just mentioned. Housing, which hasn't been applied up, uh, 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 up to now. Uh, healthcare, which is fairly problematic as I'm going to share, and schooling. Um, we did a, uh, we, we had very generously uh, uh, the permission to use the instrument from the Dr. Aikenbach and his group from the University of Vermont. And he uh, suggested the cutoff of, uh, we based the cutoff on Peruvian uh, reference samples of researches done with the CBCL at, at Peru. And uh, we, we really find interesting uh, outcomes, I'm sorry, I'm going back, uh, between, oops, between um, the um, displaced and non-displaced children uh, with a CVCL. The CVCL has seven subscales. It's very interesting. We have like um, aggression, PTSD, anxiety, and um, uh, behavioral problems within others, and it divides, it has like a total, uh, uh, you can have a total uh, number, and also you can have the division between internalizing and externalizing problems. Internalizing are mostly related to psychosomatic uh, problems, depression, uh, kids had a lot of like stomachache, headaches, uh, uh, and and we found this related to the time and the generation uh, of the displacement. I'm going to talk uh, a little bit more further. And the externalizing problems, which are here, I'm trying to move this, um, are related mostly to uh, behavioral, more aggression, more related kind of like aggression, oppositional behavior. Um, and it was also. Uh, major in the displaced children than in the non-displaced children. Um, we find something very interesting in relation to the transmission, what we call the transmission of trauma, because we, at this time, we had two generations. Up to now, we have three and four generations of displaced family, uh, and we call the first generation those children that were born at their original places and that had been uh, part of the movements, the different displacements, because usually there's not only one, but there are several displacements. And the second generation were those children who were born at Bogota after their parents and their family were have been displaced. And we found that they were more related with the first generation with the internalizing problems and the second generation with more externalizing problems, like, for example, hyperactivity, aggression, and other behavioral problems. So we really think this is a main issue that has to be researched a lot more, the, the transmission of the intergenerational inter transmission of the trauma. And this kind of like we have the hypothesis of if the direct exposure or experience of the displacement makes any difference with the indirect traumatic experience of the exposure. Uh, ILS is very uh, rigorous with and systematic with its statistical analysis. Unfortunately, she's traveling today from Rwanda to Utrecht, Poland, so she couldn't uh, be with us today, but she did univariable and multivariable regressions, uh, correlations, and uh, with the subscales and with the different total uh, um, uh, total um, scores and she really um, I, I think we we found something very interesting and it was related to the social support we found that the years uh, since displacement which is with we thought same as Nina mentioned before was very determinant of the mental health conditions of these children were not as important as the social support 
and the mental health condition of the, care, of the caretakers. The main issue that we find was the, uh, these conditions of the caretakers and the family functioning, which mostly was affected because one of the parents were deceased or were not at Bogota, they had, some had to, um, some, had, some were here and some part of the family was uh, in the countryside, so it, the family was completely divided. Um, we did all, I did afterwards this research and these uh, few um, images I will share with you are part of a qualitative study and interview and, a and support that we did for several years afterwards. And uh, uh, we, um, we had these comments, very important comments with uh, the institution interventions. Uh, most of them said that they were not, they didn't feel uh, warmly received nor culturally recognized. Um, they, they thought that they were, um, the, the child protective services and the health services were more a menace than a, a social a support for them. They were scared because the social protective services of Colombia um, have a lot of regular checkouts uh, in, in um, height and weight, and weight. And if the children do not gain the weight, the expected weight and height, uh, Bienestar Familiar, which is as our, our childhood protection agency, can take the children off from their parents. We had to do a lot of agency with our students to accompany these cases. Most of them had uh, metabolic problems, but they were assumed to be neglecting and, uh, uh, and, and were accused of neglecting behavior with these children that were often the only remain part of the family that they could have. So that's something very uh, interesting. This is a place where they live. They really uh, have a lot of uh, problem with the income. Most of them work on the garbage recollection. Uh, the, the place is a slum. It's not illegal. It's called a, in, an, an illegal invasion, barrio invasion in Spanish. And um, the, they have always uh, kind of recognized this place as part of the, um, because of the history, as part of the, of the, of the sites, the, the Bogota sites where they feel they can come and they will not be persecuted or somehow they have other uh, uh, experiences of other people that have uh, been displaced or, or moved from the countryside to the city. So this is, uh, you can well see how they live. They, there's no refugee. It's not like Nina, they have no apartments, even though the, the law since 1997 says that they have to take care and, and provide housing, we have not yet uh, count on that. And uh, this housing problem is very important, especially in the weekends, because most of the people, the parents that live with these children, live in these uh, uh, tenure, ten, ten, tenancies. We call them inquilinatos in Spanish. And uh, the governmental and non-governmental institutions that provide some support work from Monday to Friday. And on weekends, they are mostly uh, um, uh, in, in danger and in, 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 in uh, they, they can be sexually violent and they also have very low income. When they gain weight from Monday to Friday because they have food and shelter and caring in the institutions during the weekend, they are really very abundant and very vulnerable. And um, Finally, I would like to comment on something just to, to uh, relate to the uh, recommendations we thought would be important to share. And it's that uh, these, these neighborhoods are very poor and others are as poor as the IDPs. And uh, the IDPs have better conditions or at least the law gives them more conditions. So there are a lot of competitive dynamics between IDPs and other poor people in the neighborhoods. So that's why the social support is very scarce in these, in these uh, persons. They feel they're stigmatized, not only by, the, by their neighbors, but also by the health workers, because they are stigmatized for being part of the conf armed conflict, even though they're civilians that have 
not chosen to participate in the armed conflict, but they are identified as part of the armed actors of the conflict. Uh, interesting, we, we found that um, this, what, what I was sharing, that poor families have also um, various needs, uh, not needed basic needs, uh, but they do not have um, the conditions that law offers IDPs. Um, what I just mentioned between first and second generation, now we have third and fourth generation still recognized as displaced. And we found out that most of the people had attended all the interventions that we could think of, the grief process, uh, uh, by psychosocial uh, support, but uh, somehow their condition was not better. And uh, we do have a lot of problem with the coordination of the different actions. We have a lot of actions and resources, but often they're not intersectionally uh, coordinated, so most of these do not have the impact that we are really expecting. We, uh, according to what they have said in their interviews and the ongoing uh, experience, they, they say they want human-centered and more culturally sensitive interventions and, uh, and, and knowledge about their, um, their uh, culture and, and needs. Uh, there's a lot of need and the losses, but we have not been able to uh, accomplish a more community-based approach that can be culturally acceptable and sensitive for these people. And we also, this is an expertise of Ilse, she's been working in Rwanda and with various uh, shell uh, associations. We need more rigorous evaluations to assess, really assess the evidence uh, on psychosocial interventions and the impact that uh, these interventions can make. Uh, finally, I would like to thank uh, the humanitarian refugee law and the IDP network, especially David and John and my colleagues. And uh, so I think uh, this space is very important for all of us. All of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Maria Elena Restropo Espinoza for your nice presentation on uh, mental health among displaced children in Colombia. And much of your findings aligns with the uh, observations by some of us about the intergenerational transmission of trauma among people whose parents witnessed the Nigerian Biafran war. And um, I'm happy that you we are able to highlight that. And from the comments, you could see that it has touched a chord in a lot of uh, the listeners. Thank you very much. We are going to be taking questions from now. And then um, we are going back to Professor Nino. Each of the presenters is going to be given five minutes to look through the chat box and uh, choose questions that are most representative of um, the thoughts and uh, the issues they have raised, and then pick them out and address them in five minutes. So, Professor Nino, you spoke to us on uh, Georgian and Ukrainian IDPs and their mental health. Could you please address the questions that have been raised from your presentation. Thank you, dear. Uh, John Bosco, I see to see kind of comment uh, on most of them as far as I could. And I, uh, so one question is about what Diagnostic criteria are, uh, are used to make uh, the diagnosis, common mental health diagnosis. And of course, we use two main classificatory systems, DSM and, uh, um, um, and ICD, WHO system and uh, APA system. In Ukraine, we try to use uh, the screening instruments uh, uh, for for uh, diagnostic criteria represented in, in both um, uh, 
uh, classificatory systems and and here, uh, for instance, uh, uh, diagnostic criteria for PTSD in ICD-11, according to ICD-11 and DSM-5, that they were concerned. So uh, we are using this. Another question was about uh, 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 mental health of IDPs as a priority in the country policy. Uh, and also, um, uh, another colleague was asking whether IDPs health should be a local policymakers kind of issue or or national level uh, policy. And I'd love to uh, um, uh, tell uh, the colleagues that. Unfortunately, in the countries that are not that developed, and Georgia and Ukraine are those countries, of course, mental health, even clear, the priority the issue uh, uh, that from their um, uh, voters. Uh, and the, so the stigma is still heavy. And of course, it takes a lot of advocacy and a lot of lobbying, a lot of evidence to, to, um, uh, to somehow incorporate uh, mental health uh, into the state priority. And then, then comes uh, um, um, another the problem that is, uh, for instance, a uh, affected uh, population that needs another uh, lobbying and sometimes we are pretty uh, successful while lobbying the local uh, authorities municipalities and so on and so forth sometimes uh, via international uh, organizations we try to uh, change the policies um, uh, at the national level via the parliament and the legislation but also um, at the ministerial level so this is the constant fight and we need we need, really need additional instruments, mechanisms that, that support us. So I'm happy to be part of this network because I see that, um, well, I hope <laughs> to see that this network uh, collects, um, collects people who, who, who think and care about, um, about uh, these populations. Then I, I saw a very interesting uh, question, uh, three questions actually. Uh, uh, first, uh, at least the placing, the, the, um, the phrasing also, the question, are there known factors that can prevent IPs or from reporting mental health problems or seek health? So factors that, that are strengthening, factors that are um, that, that protect people, uh, as far as I understand most about that, yeah. And we know that, yeah, we all have... Uh, uh, our inner resilience and this resilience uh, also um, is a, a characteristic feature of the big groups that, that IDPs or refugees um, actually are part of. And this resilience is the dynamic process. And if in the initial weeks I collapse, then I could uh, um, stand up and uh, strengthen and uh, refocus my, myself. So nowadays we. Uh, we research resilience, uh, we might try to build resilience, not only on the individual level, but also on the community level. And of course, coping strategies that are linked to the age, because the kids, for instance, do not have that, uh, that um, uh, well, um, rich coping styles that the adult person or educated person could have. So age and educational level uh, also play a role in uh, positive, constructive, adaptive coping. And we try to, to strengthen coping uh, um, uh, well, uh, characteristics of the individuals and, and um, big groups. And uh, the one of the most um, uh, most uh, important factor that, that mediates the impact of the war and um, disasters and emergencies is a social cohesion, social support. And this is the one uh, thing that um, proves um, its value in, 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 in most research. So we should try to strengthen the social um, 
uh, fabric of, of those big groups. The second question from this um, uh, colleague is, uh, which method if it can be used to support them um, well, if 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 I'm uh, if if I understood uh, correctly, we are talking about the uh, intervention uh, methodology, uh, and uh, uh, and the the um, this a third question also brings primary health care into the into the IDP's health, and the colleague is asking what should be done. Uh, elsewhere to ensure their health care um, well-being. And uh, here I, I, I'm, uh, uh, I would like very briefly that, yeah, early intervention is important nowadays. Um, uh, we, we, we know that this age, this century is the prevention, uh, century for, for the prevention. So if we are uh, that wise and that fast, um, to prevent something, we should do it. But we also know that we should pathologize, medicalize the problem, and we should not jump in and assume that everybody is traumatized and everybody is suffering uh, from mental um, ill health. So, if we try to balance it, because nowadays early intervention studies are uh, very popular contradictory because some uh, studies show that nothing is done and some studies are shown showing that yeah it, it helps um, uh, people but we should be careful but 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 um, um, monitor and uh, and apply evidence-based interventions and those evidence-based interventions should be also empl employed by the uh, primary health care um, uh, doctors and nurses but this is not enough, I agree with the colleague. The whole system, the whole pyramid, and you could uh, um, you could refer to the um, IASC uh, guidelines and so on and so forth. The whole pyramid should be built that, that needs, uh, specific needs of the big groups, at risk groups, families, and individuals who, who are highly traumatized, for instance, torture victims. And uh, as for the approach, we should use biopsychosocial approach, not only medical, not only psychological, but, but uh, the holistic approach that considers uh, the needs and problems in all these uh, domains, actually. And uh, then um, another um, colleague is asking, um, uh, uh, what what is the role? Uh, why is the uh, 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 gender? Uh, 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 why uh, the gender uh, plays that um, important role in the mental uh, problems? And indeed, the sex and gender uh, differences in in uh, mental health uh, uh, disorders is uh, pretty. Um, important and stable findings. We know that, uh, especially in common mental disorders, we, we know that um, um, this uh, gender differences exist regarding the prevalence, symptomatology, but also outcomes, risk factors, and so on and so, so forth. And the studies uh, are uh, surprisingly pretty scarce. Why is that? Um, some authors uh, uh, tell us that uh, um, some differences are caused by the biological, um, for instance, neurochemical or stress response uh, systems that are built uh, differently in, in um, men or women uh, bodies. But uh, uh, some authors also say that women are much more open to report uh, emotional problems. So they are much more open to seek help, to, to uh, talk about their, uh, uh, their um, challenges. Um, so this, is, uh, this might be the factor that uh, uh, um, shows, uh, for instance, high prevalences in anxiety, depression, or post-traumatic stress disorder. But also, um, uh, some uh, studies indicate that there are also differences in um, 
self-esteem and body schema. Um, so girls and women are more uh, vulnerable uh, regarding their own uh, physical appearances and uh, body shame, you know, and so on and so, so forth. This might uh, play uh, the uh, uh, role. And uh, as far as I saw in, in, uh, in many uh, displaced persons' lives, um, the violence, rape, um, gender-based violence, um, um, these things also play the role. Um, and girls and women are, it seems, um, uh, kind of more exposed to such, uh, such um, sexual abuse and interpersonal um, uh, violence. So uh, this is the uh, field that uh, needs much more uh, study, but uh, very briefly, I could just um, remark uh, about that. Um, well, over. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Nina, for your insightful responses. We've enjoyed your presentation. Over to you, Dr. Maria. You may address some of the questions that have come up. Yes, well, I have the same question uh, addressed by um, David about the gender differences. And um, I would say that um, most of the of the uh, pe persons who are in the condition of IDPs are women and children, because most of the men either are uh, working or have been uh, uh, killed or or are um, could not travel or or have to be hidden because they have been uh, compromised in the conflicts, even though they don't want to participate, sometimes they are compromised. So this is a burden for women, mostly, and children. And um, women have to take care of the uh, intake, um, the, the or of providing the income, I'm sorry, the income, and also take care of the children. And uh, um, we found something that is very interesting. I, could, I, I couldn't share that, but I, I will mention it now. We did cross with the sociodemographic um, uh, statistics from the National uh, Statistic uh, Governmental Agency. And most of these women and, and, and uh, displaced uh, persons, even men, didn't have, uh, did, didn't have either technical studies nor completed their primary basic education. So they were not qualified for the uh, for any job, different type of jobs or better um, um, economic conditions or labor uh, works or, 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 or um, other possibilities. I have found as a public health practitioner that education in women is very, very important for their children, and I think that's one of the issues that has to do a lot with gender. Gender, and um, I think most of the interventions that uh, were done during did did not take into account the professional or, or the education situation of women, especially of women, because men maybe uh, they do not have a basic primary education or technical uh, education, but they can uh, work in other type of uh, uh, skill. They have other skills. And when they are here, they can work like in, in woodworking or in uh, uh, mechanic, uh, uh, which there are a lot of uh, mechanic um, stores in, in Patio Bonito or, or construction building. And uh, women cannot have those uh, same opportunities as men. Um, so I really think the situation of women, especially displaced women, is a lot more uh, deprived and, and, uh, un, un, it's very un, un, in, unequit, uh, how can I say, it? it's not, it, it, there's a lot of problems with equity in women, especially in this, um, in this uh, 
cultures and these groups and these uh, IDPs persons, the, the IDPs. Um, there's also a question about the transmission, which is related to this, um, the, the intergenerational transmission, which is mostly, uh, this transmission is mostly done by women. They try to um, remain very, at, very attached to their culture. Sometimes they become very rigid in order to kind of like uh, support themselves to what they lost. Uh, they saw that uh, the group of uh, that the group of uh, Rotterdam University Medical Center of uh, Rotterdam has done a lot of research in migrants, longitudinal research in uh, social inequities uh, with uh, children, migrant children, and non-migrant children of poor, uh, also of poor uh, groups or, or vulnerable groups. And they have found that uh, some, especially some type of migrants uh, are very rigid and um, there's also a risk for, we, for girls, not women, girls, 10 year old girls, for example, descendant of Indi Indians, um, in, 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 it's not Hindus. We, we called it Hinduism, but it's really not Hinduism, it's Indian. Indian cultures become very rigid and especially girls, Indian girls and other type of cultures uh, have a lot of mental health problems, including suicide, risk for suicide. Um, but I, I would like to enhance on the community action. I, I think we lack of, of um, development and research and understanding of the sub community support when they can become part of a, of a, of a, whatever community, a religious community, or for example, the, the school that worked, that was uh, providing education for these uh, children in the condition of displaced, forced displacement, uh, were religious. And they kind of supported these women who were very lonely, who had lost most of their emotional and social support and also, there's something that we found in the qualitative and the ethnography that we did for several years. It's that they live in the countryside, so they don't have to pay for an orange or for a banana or for the milk or for the eggs. And when they come to a city like Bogota, everything depends on, on, on the monetary transaction. That was one of the things that made, made them feel very vulnerable because they lacked of uh, income um, and they didn't know how to deal in order to satisfy their basic needs with this economic transaction. They could not get food for their children if they had no money um, and we do not have uh, payment, daily payment, but we have like quincena every 15 days or monthly payment. So they had to really, really um, um, do a lot of effort to uh, be able to provide food, housing. These te illegal tenant, ten, uh, tenants are very abusive. They know these people do, do not have uh, support nor um, paperwork, even though they're illegal. And they charge uh, absurd uh, amounts that are unacceptable and offer living conditions that are very, um, very um, uh, uh, scarce. I, mean, I, ha I, I met families, displaced families that were living on the backyard without, uh, without um, roof, and they were paying kind of like $30, uh, a, a $30 fee. And that's the difference when they say, we, we kind of uh, uh, try to um, research on the type of housing they had. And they, when they say they have an apartment, it's that they do not have to share the bathroom and the kitchen with others because these houses, these houses are that way. If you, if you don't have enough money, money, you just have the room, but you have to share the kitchen and the bathroom. And that's when we have a lot of like sexual abuse and a lot of uh, other problems. So really the conditions are very vulnerable. Colombia was accused in the year of 2003 and 2004 of not uh, 
not complying the constitutional mandates of the protection for these persons. And uh, another law was emitted, but to protect the armed actors of the paramilitaries during that government in 2005. Then another time, the constitutional um, the court, the constitutional court of Colombia declared that the Col Colombian government was not providing and completing to the laws. And we have kind of like being in the same way it, it goes and come back and, and then this, the, the court uh, emits a, a sentence and then a, a new law it's emitted. But really, we, we are far, very distant from completing what the uh, constitution and the law uh, should provide them. And in, the, in relation with the health, I would like to mention, even though it's not, um, it's not uh, uh, mentioned here, but we have a, uh, a type of system, even though they have, they're, they're supposed to be offered uh, health care. We have two types of health care provision. We have one subsidized for the poor, which is the one that attends them, and one con the, of the ones that contribute or the ones that can pay our, our fee, and it's called the like, contributiva. And uh, when, when the law said th their needs, their uh, health needs are uh, beyond the problem of who's going to pay the bill for their uh, access and their health attention, um, finally, the economical uh, situation ended up being more important than the than the the rights and the law the rights that the law should provide them so there's a lot of research showing that with the system we have the health system is 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 very determinant on their access to a, a health provision mental health and other health provisions um i really think this intergenerational trauma is a very important issue i hope we can do more research on it, on this transmission. But what I can really um, mention is what I said. I think we really need to think in a more community-oriented and intersectoral uh, intervention. I would, I really think that more than the, the making them dependent on our attention, even though health attention is important, I think we need to foster more community and social bonds and um, help these people be part of their communities and not not uh, compete with all these issues and dynamics that we are seeing competitive dynamics uh, that are very very um, frustrating thank you professor maria um by the way, let me remind the listeners that uh, the brief bio of uh, our presenters are in the chat box. David has posted them earlier. Please feel free to check and then look at their bio. I want to use this opportunity to appreciate the two great speakers that we have for today's webinar. Professor Nino Mahashville and uh, Professor Maria Elena Prestropo Espinosa. It's been great having two of you talk to us in this month's webinar of the Health and Internal Displacement. Using this opportunity to thank the listeners who have found time to join this meeting and uh, share with uh, and listen to our speakers who have shared their ideas, your, your thoughts, your comments, and uh, your observations, which you've expressed in the chat box, uh, quite commendable. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that uh, our speakers have enjoyed uh, interacting with you today. The, Monthly webinar is an event of the Health and Internal Displacement Network, which was launched in uh, April 2021. It is a global network of uh, researchers and practitioners that tries to give uh, deeper attention into, issue, into issues of uh, health as it concerns IDPs. Um, I'm going to be calling on 
Dr. David Cantor to make some announcements about future events by members of the network. And Professor David has been pushing the uh, activities of the network together with uh, Gina and Bayard. And I am happy that their efforts are yielding great results. Dr. David, do you have any announcements? Well, many thanks indeed. First of all, John Bosco for chairing the seminar with such panache, and of course to Nina and Maria Elena for, for your presentations and thoughts on the many questions. In just 60 seconds, I'd like to talk a little bit about what's next for the Health and Internal Displacement Network. Of course, the network is keeping operating in the background, running. However, we're taking a brief summer break to allow everybody to recharge their batteries and remarshal their forces. So you should look out for a new series of webinars come September, October, which will be announced in all of the usual places where you've seen these ones advertised. Um, in addition, we should be appearing on a new researching internal displacement website that um, will be launched over the summer and where all of the hidden events and activities um, should also be profiled prominently too. Alongside that, um, over the summer, if you're working in the area of research on health and internal displacement, there will be a call for papers published fairly shortly in the next week, I would say, by the Elsevier Journal of Migration and Health, which is putting together a series guest edited by members of the Health and Internal Displacement Network, including John Bosco and Nino, Maria Elena, and uh, a whole range of others, um, to call for submissions, maybe existing research that you're doing or concepts, papers that you're keen to write on internal displacement and health. So keep a good look out for that. That should be on the journal website in the next week or two. So that's the Elsevier Journal of Migration and Health. We look forward to seeing any submissions or proposals that you wish to put forward there. The deadline for that, for completed papers to be submitted, is the 15th of December, but get started early as there may well be a, a rush of papers. And the journal has committed to publishing all of those papers that we accept through peer review, um, free of charge with the fees waived. Um, and again, that would be in an issue early next year. Above and beyond that, I just remains for me to say thanks once again to all of our speakers, chairs and other members of the Health and Internal Displacement Network and to wish you all uh, an excellent summer and a real chance to relax and hopefully enjoy some summer sun, even if, even if you're in England, which um, seems not blessed in that way at the moment. So thanks, everybody. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the seminar and we will look forward to connecting with you once again in the new academic year come September, October. In the meantime, if you've got any questions, drop an email to myself to, or to Bayard Roberts at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. With that, I'll bid you a farewell and thanks again for all of your participation.